Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless last spring in march at a press conference in brussels joe biden explained that the sanctions he was imposing against russia while morally necessary we're also going to cause food shortages around the world including here in the united states it's going to be real he said now, Biden said this in a very odd way. There was no hint or panic, emotions you'd expect from a leader predicting the deaths of human beings from starvation. None of that. Instead, there was pure nonchalant casualness. Biden could have been describing the weather. Then, Biden continued, recounting a conversation he'd had with European allies. He told us all about it. When he met with the group, Biden said, they spoke about, quote, how we could increase and disseminate more rapidly food shortages. That's what Joe Biden said, verbatim. It's on tape. So here you have the president of the United States pledging to increase food shortages at a press conference. Now, that seemed like a newsworthy event, but not a single news organization in this country seemed to notice it happened, nor did the White House correct it. But others were watching, so within days, that clip wound up on social media, and Facebook flagged it immediately as, quote, false news. Now, strictly speaking, that's untrue. There's nothing false about the video. It was entirely real. No one can test that. But apparently, Facebook users were supposed to understand that Joe Biden is senile, and therefore he's not accountable for his own words. Taking Joe Biden literally qualifies as, quote, misinformation. Now, we'll leave that whole episode for you to assess. We can't know what Joe Biden was thinking, if anything, when he uttered those words in Brussels. We can only tell you what happened afterward. Strange disasters began to beset food processors all over the United States. In April, the next month, the headquarters of one of this country's largest organic food distributors was destroyed in a fire, cause unknown. The next month, in a single week actually, two separate private plane crashes took out two separate food processing centers. One plane hit a General Mills plant in Georgia, the other plane hit a food plant in Idaho. By the way, back in February, a boiler explosion obliterated a potato processing plant in Oregon, and so on. So even people who aren't given to connecting the dots, who don't think of themselves as conspiracy nuts, began to wonder, is there something here? But no one could tell. The Biden administration had no answers and no way to get to the answers because they had no data. And that's interesting because the Biden administration tracks a lot of things, the things that it cares about, the race and ethnicity and sex life, for example, of every person in America. Do we have enough trans-Pacific Islanders playing woodwinds in major symphonies? How about gay Southeast Asians and long-haul trucking? These are the questions that concern the bean counters in the Biden administration. And yet at the same time, that same administration keeps no real records about the infrastructure of our food supply. Apparently that has never occurred to them. So honestly, we can't really know one way or the other because we don't have a baseline whether something strange is going on with food suppliers. But some days you do wonder. On Saturday, an enormous commercial egg farm in central Connecticut burned to the ground for no obvious reason, huge fire, at least 20 fire departments responded, fought the blaze for over eight hours. More than 100,000 chickens died. That's a sad story. But what's interesting is that most media companies did not consider it a story at all. Weird, considering egg prices have become an actual problem for most Americans. Egg prices are up more than 100% in many places. And yet at that exact moment, when eggs are a concern, 100,000 chickens die in a freak fire and the New York Times, which is right next door in a neighboring state, does not even cover the fire? What is that? Don't worry. Things like this have nothing to do with egg prices, say the media. It's just avian flu. Watch. Egg consumption has grown over the years as many people are eating them as their main protein source. But the production has slumped because of the ongoing bird or avian flu epidemic. Over the last year, the USDA says nearly 58 million birds have been infected in the U.S., making it the deadliest outbreak in U.S. history. Unfortunately, the infected birds have to be killed, causing the egg supplies to fall and prices to surge. In some cases, stores are running out and limiting the amount people can buy. 
Oh, we bought eggs earlier this week here at Fry's and Levine. Uh, we paid $8.99 for a dozen eggs. So if you ask the Agriculture Department, for example, or anyone in the Biden administration, to the extent they're paying attention, which is not much, they'll tell you that egg prices are high because avian flu. The price have nothing to do with chicken farms burning down. Again, not that anyone in the government tracks that kind of thing. Why would they? Because nothing like that could ever happen. Settle down, QAnon! And a lot of people, particularly the national news media, people who could not identify a chicken if it didn't come with dipping sauce, are satisfied with that explanation. But we noticed that some farmers who deal with chickens every day are not convinced. Some of them, some chicken farmers have noticed something odd. Their chickens aren't laying eggs or as many eggs. And these chickens don't appear sick with avian flu. They're not dying, they're still alive. They're just not producing eggs. Now, healthy hens lay eggs on a regular basis every 24 to 26 hours, but suddenly, Chicken owners all over the country, not all of them, but a lot of them, are reporting they're not getting any eggs or as many. So what's causing that? Clearly something's causing that. Some have concluded their chicken feed may be responsible. Watch. Is the commercial feed the reason so many people's chickens have not been laying at all? This is a question that I am asking myself and I have seen all over TikTok, Facebook, everywhere. I'm talking about chickens, tons of people who are having no eggs for six, seven months. Like this is not normal. I have at least 60 hens that should be laying. I have a flock of roughly a hundred and I was getting two to three eggs in the summer all summer long. I genuinely think it's the feed, especially after seeing so many people have the same problem, switching to a local feed and it fixing itself. So why would we just put that clip on TV? Because that chicken owner speaks for all chicken owners because she's the world's greatest expert on avian questions? Probably not. But because the people who should be keeping track of what's going on are clearly not keeping track of what's going on because they just don't care. And so instead of going to the usual sources at the Ag Department or calling the White House press office, we decided to listen to people who actually have chickens. And that one, for example, the lady you just saw says she checked, switched her chicken feed and it solved her problem. Her chickens began laying eggs once again immediately. Now, the specific brand of feed referenced in that video is called Producers Pride. It's made by Purina. Most chicken feed brands are made by Purina. Purina also makes Producers Pride, that's the cattle feed, recently subject to a recall after regulators linked that product to a series of unexplained cattle deaths. It was removed from shells because there was a good chance you shouldn't be feeding it to livestock. Could that be happening again? Now, we don't know, but we should tell you, because again, no one else seems to be keeping track of this, that it's not just producer's pride that some chicken owners are worried about. Some have concerns about several other chicken feed brands made by Purina. Purina. So we reached out to the company today, because again, we're agnostic on this, but we figured we would do a little poking. And they said they've looked into it too, and their feed is not the problem. And that may absolutely be true. We don't know. What we did notice, though, was that that explanation was more than enough for most media companies, trained as they are to accept corporate press releases as the final word on any given topic. Well, they said it's not a problem, so it's not a problem. We don't think that's the last word. Again, we can't tell you for certain either way. But we do know, and here's really the point, that America's food supply is one of those topics It's worth being a little paranoid about. This is a matter of national survival, of food, the question on which empires rise and fall. And in this specific case, eggs, poultry, and chicken, avian products, are major, major sources of protein in the diets of most Americans. And you need protein to live. If you don't have enough, you get protein deficiency, and that can stunt the growth in children. So a question like this, whatever its cause, could easily flower into an actual public health crisis. And of course, it's also potentially a national security problem. There are so few eggs right now at such high cost that smugglers are trafficking eggs across our border. Watch this. Here at the busy San Ysidro border crossing in California, we're traveling fast about a new good being smuggled into the U.S. U.S. Customs and Border Protection has reported an 108% increase in seized egg products and poultry that people have tried to smuggle through U.S. ports of entry in just the last two months. So are we being a little paranoid about the American food supply? Yes, we are, and we're proud of it. And our leaders should be even more paranoid always about our food supply. Food, energy, water. Those are the three things that matter. The rest of it is noise. And of course, as always, they're ignoring what really matters. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. We are fast approaching a time known as the tribulation that Jesus says will be the worst time in human history. 
as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. We are currently witnessing events that will continue to become more frequent and more intense until God pours out his final judgments on an unbelieving and unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation includes the price of food being so high and scarce that it will cost a full day's wages just to barely get enough to eat as we read in Revelation 6, 5, and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. In this prophecy, it will cost a day's wages just for a loaf of bread. We are not in the tribulation period yet, but we are getting extremely close. So let's say you're eating packaged food and you happen to have your reading glasses within reach and you decide to look at what's on the label. What's in this stuff, you wonder? And it says sustainable. What does that mean? Well, as you can see on your screen, it turns out that a lot of companies use the term sustainable to suggest crickets, crickets as in the chirping insects. Why are crickets winding up in your snack foods, and is that a good idea? Should you be eating crickets without your knowledge? Dr. Mark Siegel joins us to assess. This is actually very serious. Now, first of all, eating insects is legal in the United States per the FDA. And yes, crickets are in flour, crickets are in cotton candy snacks. Insects are high in protein, low in fat, low in carbohydrate. They eat them in Africa, they eat them in Asia, they eat them in Mexico. Not a lot of people are eating them here yet. I can understand why. I'm certainly not eating insects. But the problem is that the FDA, Tucker, has a defects standard. And that's what it sounds like, very lax. And so insects get into your food in the growing process and the processing process. Listen to this. The FDA allows, allows up to 450 insect parts in a box of spaghetti, 30 insect parts in a chocolate bar, 30 insect parts in a jar of peanut butter, in spices, and almost anything you can name, there are insect parts in there. Huh. Disgusting, yes, but I'll tell you something else. As a physician, people are allergic to this stuff because insects are a lot like shellfish. So if you have a shellfish allergy, you could get itchy from any of this stuff. You could end up in the emergency room having problems breathing. You could get asthma. You could get a rash. And there's nothing I can do about this. So I'm, I'm very concerned about the, lax, the laxity of this. Now, there's one other thing that I want to bring up here, which is that currently we're seeing food skyrocketing prices under the current situation, eggs going up the wazoo, and meat. And so more and more you're seeing this insects appear, and Tucker, I wouldn't be surprised if we end up with a bug mandate that you and I have to eat insects. What do you think? Is that the next mandate coming down the pike at us, Tucker? Everything from protecting the lives of unborn babies to immigration and gun control. Why are Americans so divided over the big issues of our time? Republicans control the House of Representatives by a narrow margin, and Democrats narrowly control the Senate. The U.S. Congress is simply one reflection of our society as a whole. So how do we restore unity to our nation? How do we look past political differences and find moral common ground? Well, joining us to provide some thoughts on this is Southern Evangelical Seminary President Phil Jinn. Judge Jinn, instead of viewing Russia, China, Iran, or North Korea as our biggest adversaries, those who claim to be Republican or Democrat see members of the opposing party as the nation's biggest adversary. Why is that? Well, I'm not so sure that it doesn't go back even uh, as far back as the Roman Empire that crumbled from within. And, and they may be correct in that we are our own worst enemies in this nation. And I think one of the reasons is that, as I've stated before, that we've, uh, as, a, as a people, tried to erase, erase what I call the God line in our uh, culture and in our society. And as we get closer to the God line, obviously, the closer we are to each other. And as we've erased that God line in our culture, then we don't have that standard, that cohesiveness that draws us together and ultimately your truth is your truth, and my truth is my truth, and I'm going to try to get in control 
so I can enforce my truth on you before you get into control to enforce your truth on me. Is there such a thing as absolute truth? The unsaved hold the view there is no right or wrong. Therefore, whatever feels or seems right at the time and in that situation is right. Christians hold the view that there are indeed absolute realities and standards that define what is true and what is not. To the unsaved, tolerance has become the one cardinal virtue of the postmodern society, the one absolute, and therefore, intolerance is the only evil. Any dogmatic belief, especially a belief in absolute truth, is viewed as intolerance, the ultimate sin to an unbeliever. If there is absolute truth, then there are absolute standards of right and wrong, and we are accountable to those standards. This accountability is what people are really rejecting when they reject absolute truth. The denial of absolute truth and the cultural relativism that comes with it are the logical result of a society that has embraced the theory of evolution as the explanation for life. If evolution is true, then life has no meaning, we have no purpose, and there cannot be any absolute right or wrong. Man is then free to live as he pleases and is accountable to no one for his actions. Yet, no matter how much sinful men deny the existence of God and absolute truth, they still will someday stand before God in judgment. The Bible declares this in Romans 1, 19-22, Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Is there any evidence for the existence of absolute truth? Yes, there is the human conscience, that certain something within us that tells us the world should be a certain way, that some things are right and some things are wrong. Our conscience convinces us there is something wrong with suffering, pain, and evil, and it makes us aware that love, generosity, compassion, and peace are positive things for which we should strive. The Bible describes the role of the human conscience as we read in Romans 2, 14 through 16. For when Gentiles, who do not have the law, by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. God has revealed his truth to us through his word, the Bible. Knowing absolute truth is only possible through a personal relationship with the one who claims to be the truth, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life, and the only path to God. The fact that absolute truth does exist points us to the truth that there is a sovereign God who created the heavens and the earth and who has revealed himself to mankind in order that we might know him personally through his son, Jesus Christ. That is the absolute truth. Here's an example of how that's happening. Many uh, Generation Zers think people who disagree with them are their enemies. About a third of them say they have no religious affiliation whatsoever. And nearly one out of five say they're either agnostic or atheists. According to Pew Research, women have grown noticeably less religious over the last decade. The share of nuns among women has risen by 10 percent since 2009. And the share of women who identify as Christian has fallen from 80 percent to 69 percent over that same period. The Bible indicates that there will be a great apostasy during the end times as we read in 2 Thessalonians 2.3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Falling away is the Greek word apostasia, which means defection from the truth, properly the state, apostasy. Apostasia, from which we get the English word apostasy, refers to a general defection from the true God, the Bible, in the Christian faith. What impact is that having on our society or will it have in the future? Well, I, I think that's a further erasure of the God line, uh, obviously. And, and, and we've redefined the word tolerance. Uh, it used to be 
The word tolerance meant that you and I might have some basic differences, but yet we respected one another and could get along with one another and, and talk about things uh, civilly. But now, uh, if, uh, if you and I don't agree on one, maybe one thing out of a hundred, then we're bitter enemies. That's not what tolerance is all about. In fact, uh, in reality is truth is pretty dogmatic, um, uh, particularly of that which is not true. Here's a truth. In Matthew 12, 25, Jesus said, every house divided against itself cannot stand. Spiritual warfare is off the charts. Battle lines are being drawn and people are choosing sides. The United States is divided on just about every issue. Race, homosexuality, transgenderism, abortion, climate change, gun rights, and the list goes on. Jesus said that a kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, as we read in Matthew 12, 25. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. Jesus tells us he is the reason behind the division we are seeing today as we read in Luke 12, 51 through 53. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two and two against three. Father will be divided against son and son against father mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Jesus then goes on to rebuke the multitudes for not knowing the time they were living in, as we read in Luke 12, 54 through 56. Then he also said to the multitudes, whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, a shower is coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be hot weather, and there is. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not discern this time? Jesus was rebuking the multitudes for not recognizing the times they were living in. Jesus, the promised Messiah, was standing right there before them, and they didn't even know it. If the multitudes of Jesus' day missed Jesus' first coming, how much more important is it for us today to discern the times we live in and make sure we don't miss the signs of his second coming? Jesus now goes on to tell a parable about his true followers and those who are not, as we read in Matthew 13, 24 through 30. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced the crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us to then go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Jesus went on to explain the parable of the wheat and tares, as we read in Matthew 13, 36-43. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Those who genuinely follow Jesus are the wheat, and those who don't are the tares. I believe we are witnessing the wheat being separated from the tares. Are you a wheat or a tare?
The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.